Okay, um, well, Aubrey, um, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us what you do? My name is Dr. Aubrey de Grey. I'm the Chief Science Officer of a foundation based in California called Sense Foundation. And what we work on is developing regenerative medicine solutions to the diseases and disabilities of old age. One of the, one of the handy things about what we do is that it's very much a divide and conquer approach. We split the problem of aging up into lots of sub-problems and we work on each of those. Which means that there's never just one thing going on. We're always working on lots of different things at the same time. There are some areas which we think need to be done, but we don't work on them. But the only reason that that happens is because those areas are being worked on by other people and they're well funded and everything. We work on the ones, we tend to prioritise the ones that are being more neglected. But yes, there's progress all over the place all the time, including in areas that we're not working on, of course. Uh, we've, we've developed good ways of identifying enzymes that break down substances that we can't naturally break down in the body and that cause diseases like cardiovascular disease and macular degeneration. And lately we've been able to get those genes working in mammalian cells, which is a, a big breakthrough, a big milestone for us. I think one of the most exciting things that I've seen for a long time happened only about a month ago when we saw the first example of health benefits for mice uh, conferred by removing cells that there are too many of them toxic but that we're not dying on their own. That's an aspect of sense, of what we do, that I consider to be part of regenerative medicine, but that most people would not instinctively consider to be part of regenerative medicine. And so it's been very helpful for us in not only um, the science, but also in the communication, in essentially getting people to understand that regenerative medicine is broader than they might have thought and therefore that using regenerative medicine against aging is more plausible than they might have thought. In the next 10 years, I'm very optimistic at this point that we will essentially get everything working in mice. In other words, we will be in a position where we can take mice who are already in middle age, let's say they're two thirds of the way through their natural lifespan, and before we've done anything to them at all, and at that point, do lots of things to them simultaneously, which, in, which jointly will be able to keep those mice healthy and reasonably useful for another couple of years over and above the two years that they would already have lived. That, I think, is what we need to get to, to really totally convince everyone in the scientific community that we're going to be able to do this for humans too. That's going to be, as far as I'm concerned, the most important breakthrough for us. It will convince the people in general that regenerative medicine can work against it. And I think we've got a very good chance of going there within 10 years. The way I see the opinion process working is the people that really need to be convinced are the other scientists in the field. The mainstream scientists who would normally want to be quite conservative in their predictions of what's going to happen in the future. Once they're convinced sufficiently that they're willing to go on camera and say, what they, say that it's going to happen, then it's, everything's easy after that. Opinion formers like Oprah Winfrey, who are also going to be very careful not to jump on bandwagons until they're really sure that those bandwagons are not going off the rails, um, will start doing so. And as soon as they start doing so, the public opinion will change overnight. And as soon as that happens, public policy will change overnight in all the democracies of the world, because it will become impossible to get elected unless you have a manifesto commitment to have a war on aging. So it's all about the science. It's all about the science getting to a point where the scientists are, though they're not working on it themselves, are happy to endorse it and say that it's the right way to go. I've got to say that's an excellent question. Why are people so cowardly? That's the your question. I have absolutely no idea. In fact, there's a lot that I don't understand about a lot of people. But for me, for sure, I know that I'm doing, I'm doing the best I can to make a difference to the future of humanity, and I can't understand why everyone else doesn't want to do the same, especially scientists. You know, I think a lot of the problem with science these days is that there's not enough money in science, so you have to battle tooth and nail to get the funding to do anything, and that makes people intrinsically more conservative because they know that they've got to minimise the risk of people finding any reason not to give them money. That means being conservative in the projects that they try to get money to do, 
And it also means being conservative in how they in their comments, their public comments about other people's so, stuff. So, you know, it, it's really doing enormous harm to radical progress. I mean, most, most science is not radical, it's very low risk, low gain. Uh, but the big advances, of course, are made typically with the high risk products. So those products are not going down anymore. Because it's not just a problem with aging, it's a problem with all of the other stuff. Private, I wasn't really talking about the private sector in what I just said. I was mainly talking about scientists working in academia who get most of their money from the government. Um, the problem in the private sector is similar, but actually it's even worse. Uh, because there's an additional problem that the people that these scientists work for have a profit motive. They have shareholders to worry about. So they're even more short-termist than the government would be. The government has to get re-elected, but typically not for a couple of years, where the average company cared about every quarterly profit you know, um, prediction and so on. So, it's actually even worse working as a, as a radical scientist in the private sector than it is in academia. I think, without doubt, communication and the ease and cheapness of communication that now exists in the world, thanks to the internet, has made an enormous difference to the way science and technology progress, so same as it had in every other aspect of life. Um, in, in science and technology, I think it's mainly... Um, well, there are two big things in my world. Number one is it doesn't really matter where you publish anymore. You can publish in a relatively minor journal and your publication will still... I mean, it has to be a respectable journal, but your publication will still get publicised through the standard channels like PubMed, saying if you publish in Science or Nature, which used not to be the case. Um, secondly, uh, because, of, because of the worldwide nature of the internet, uh, you've got an enormous opportunity for scientists in one jurisdiction that may have very different um, uh, regulatory regime than another jurisdiction, uh, you know, to work on something that might be very difficult to work on in the place where the, you know, the, the work that it, it jumps off from was done. Uh, for example, moving a particular technology from mice to humans might be a lot easier in, um, you know, in China than it would be in the West. I think that I'm not a psychologist at all. I haven't really studied why people make stupid decisions. Um, and of course, this is, not, this, is not, this is again not a problem um, restricted to the enthusiasm for particular technology or partic for particular research. Um, we heard talk today about people's irrationality about cryonics, which is you know, a fine example. Um, and just as irrational, perhaps even more so. You, know, it's not even, you can't even really be based just on fear of the unknown. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I'm always eager to hear the input from psychologists with regard to any explanations for why um, people think what they do about this and indeed for what they do about this. Uh, but at the moment, most of my um, improvement, most of my progress in understanding that well enough to actually provide good arguments that really work on people has been through sheer trial and error. The whole rejuvenation thing comes down to identifying what types of molecular and cellular damage accumulate in the body and then figuring out how to fix them, how to repair that damage before it gets to the level of abundance that's bad for you, that's pathogenic. So the big eureka moment that I had maybe 10 or 11 years ago now was to identify that we could actually classify all of the various types of damage that exist during life um, into these seven major categories. So one of them being cell loss, where cells die and they're not automatically replaced by other cells. One of them being having too many cells because cells don't die when they're supposed to. Um, another being have having too many cells because cells divide when they're not supposed to, that's cancer of course. And then four types of damage at the molecular level. First of all, molecular garbage, just byproducts of normal metabolic processes that the body doesn't know how to break down or to excrete. And I, I talk about Junk in, that sort of junk inside the cell and outside the cell as two separate categories. And then one other category inside the cell, which is the accumulation of mitochondrial mutations. And then finally, outside the cell again, the accumulation of cross-links between proteins making up the extracellular matrix, which causes stiffening of tissues like the artery and leading to hypertension and so on. So those are the seven major categories. What do you
you think the last frontier of this uh, rejuvenation process? I'm almost certain that the last frontier, the highest part of is going to be the business of having too many cells because they're dividing when they're not supposed to, in other words, cancer. The reason why I think that's the hardest is because cancer has natural selection at its disposal. Every time a cell divides, <coughs> it's got the chance to have more mutations. And of course, cancer cells are particularly unstable genetically, so they have more mutations than their average cell. So whenever you try to get clever with cancer, it gets clever too, figures out how to try to escape your therapy. So we'll have to come up with therapies that are so powerful that even the, um, the mutational creativity of cancers can't escape it. And I think we've done that, but it's going to be quite a while before we, develop, before we actually get the therapy working. Okay, so what, are, what do you think the techniques are? Well, what, what, what? well the therapy that I've proposed is what I call WILT, which stands, believe it or not, for whole body interdiction of lengthening of telomeres. Um, it's basically a, a combination therapy. On the one hand, we do gene therapy to remove the genes that are responsible for elongating telomeres, the end of the chromosome. And on the other hand, since we want to do this indiscriminately rather than trying to selectively diagnose it for cancer, we will have side effects in terms of the loss of function of stem cells in the blood and the skin and the gut. And we will need to replace those stem cells, replenish those stem cell pools every 10 years or so with new stem cells that have nice long telomeres. The point about being indiscriminate, about not actually trying to target the cancer cells selectively, is the real, the real key to all of this, the real reason why I think this therapy has the chance to be so much more powerful than anything that exists today or anything that's coming down because the key point about cancer, the main way in which cancers successfully escape therapy that we have today, is by mutating so as to, if you like, masquerade as non-cancer cells to look to, 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 to evade the selectivity of the, of, the, um, of the therapy. So if we don't have selectivity in the first place, then we avoid that problem. Okay, wow, by not having cell activity. That's that, right. That the only sounds... way is you indiscriminately hit all cells in the same way. In particular, you hit them, in this case, in a way that removes their ability to elongate their telomeres. And that makes sense because all cancers need to elongate their telomeres in order to divide. The thing is, all non-cancer cells also need to elongate their telomeres in order to divide. But the good news is that most of our cells don't divide very often.